I'm a young minister of the gospel, and um, I've come to realize the place of men that have experience in their work with God. And every moment that God affords me the opportunity to be around his servants um, has been iconic, has been quite significant as I appreciate the gift of this man of God. He is a well of wisdom. And the little time we um, shared just today has changed my perspective on many things. Hallelujah. Please celebrate Dr. Shalom. Amen. Lord, tonight we ask that you stretch forth your hand, open the vistas of heaven, cause us to see from the right perspective so that we'll know when and how to take our journey. Grant, O oh God, that the least among our numbers will become as strong as David. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts. Chapter 10, we are still looking at uh, shifting into a new dimension. Shifting into a new dimension. Now, I need to tell us a few things before we read Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Can you reduce the volume a little? Tell us a few things. Amen. Before... I read Acts chapter 10, verse 9. The first thing I want to say about the kingdom of God is that it is a kingdom that administers its purposes through seals. There are several things in God that are sealed, or you may want to say classified, until... until the season for the breaking of those seals find expression. Just like your life, for instance. Uh, if, you, if your work with God has been consistent, if your work with God has been consistent, you will agree with me that there was a time in your life when several things that you are aware of now was not disclosed to you. It is not as if the things were not existing those things were existing in God, but he had not been made available to you. So normally, when God wants to shift your dimensions, what he does is that he breaks a seal. There is an economy of spiritual things that is made available to you when a seal over your life is broken. And it will be needful for me to show you an environment, an atmosphere where seals are broken. There, there, there's some form of level of, a, of obedience you will need to bring to the table before the heavens will determine to unveil another seal in your procedure. The, the technology, the exposure that you have, the things that you have seen in God can actually plateau. You can be running around in circles. You can get to a particular point and not enter into more current things when your seal is not broken. And for many people, as we speak now, they have reached a point where heaven is unwilling to break more seals over their atmosphere. That means their current scent is what they will retain until they go out of the scene. And so during seasons, when God breaks seals, what he wants to do is that he wants to bring us into fresh dimension. I'm not talking about fresh levels. If you're operating on a certain level, you can, on the strength of your current um, um, operation, you can actually envisage that, okay, if I'm consistent, this is where I, 
I'm seeing myself in the next five years. As long as you can still see that, you are seeing that from, from the perspective of levels, that, okay, you are going to go from this level. If you can still see it, you, the, your reference point for that site is captured in a certain context. It means what you can perceive in your heart, in your mind, is a function of the reality that you are exposed to at the moment. But the Bible says that eyes have not seen. He said, ears have not heard, neither has he entered into the heart of man. Are you still with me? Anything that eyes have not seen, that ears have not heard, that has not entered into the heart of man, that's what the Bible calls a mystery. And you know that the kingdom of heaven operates by mysteries. When God wants to open up a mystery, he gives us the opportunity to enter into another dimension. You, 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 See, these dimensions I'm talking about and the technologies that are captured with them are things that your heart cannot anticipate. Are you with me? Now, so I want to take us briefly, you know, as the time will permit us. What, you, you were the one? All right, so let's try again. Let's try. Just, just uh, because... Uh, the prophet has said that God wants to put some things on us during this conference. I, I want to build from that perspective. That is actually what is about to happen tonight. Uh, it's not an amen thing. Let me, let, me, let me tell you. If you were not chosen before today, this is just like in Nigeria, someone can win an election. But you are not inaugurated until there is a handover day. What I'm saying is, God has selected people already. So this kind of an event is an inauguration to bring you into what you have already been selected. This is not a selection. So your amen will not facilitate it. <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. But I, I don't mind the amen anyway. <laughs> this is an inauguration. Some things are going on in heaven and prophetic people all over the world are trying to build the body of Christ and to point the body of Christ to the things that are going on in God's layer so that we can begin to make adjustments for adequate alignments uh, in order to be able to fully appropriate what is moving in the heavens. So a lot is moving right now. And some seals, ancient seals, that hold the key to our access to new technologies in the heavens are about to give way yeah so that we can begin to understand some things in god that he kept away from us so that we could mature in the things that he had committed into our hands so a new season entirely something that may not relate with the previous seasons that we have known is about to be ushered into the earth and every child of God is enjoined to pay attention because God has something to say. Turn your Bible to the book of uh, Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, verse number 9, the Bible says, And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour and he became very hungry and would have eaten but while they made ready he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet neat at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air and he, there came a voice to him rise peter kill and eat rise peter i'll add two more verses when i've explained um what is going on here Hallelujah. Now the back end of the scripture, the story I read to us was that there was a meeting in the heavens. 
just like the day of Pentecost began from the throne room it was from the throne room that the rushing mighty wind came from and invaded the upper room so if we want to tell the story of Pentecost we need to understand the politics that took place in the throne room because the upper room was a mere victim of what took place in the throne room and in this particular occasion there was a meeting in the throne room. and the meeting that was held in the throne room there was a decision that was made the decision that was reached in the meeting was that it was time for the gospel to be released to the Gentiles and in that meeting I can imagine that um, um, oh, maybe I need to show us a scenario a prototype meeting in the book of Zechariah so that you can understand how the interactions of such heavenly meeting and, uh, and the, the quota and constituencies that must be filled in these meetings before the meeting can actually take place it, it, no need, no need for that. No need for that. No need. Um, there was a meeting. And the conclusion of the meeting was that it was time for the gospel to invade the Gentile. The conclusion of the meeting was also that Peter was recommended as an agency that will be used to facilitate this new dimension of heaven's invasion strategy. I hope you know when policies like this come from heaven what heaven makes available in order to make it efficacious is that the special graces are released. <laughs> I'm not talking about graces that people are used to. Special ordinations. Special offices among territories are created to accommodate the uniqueness of that which God wants to unleash. And so Peter was the personnel that was recommended to pioneer this new face of kingdom possibility. Now I'd like you to see, okay, that's what happened in heaven. Are you with me? You are not with me. Maybe I need to change the scripture. Maybe that, that might help. Maybe I need to go to the book of John and plainly look at what Jesus said. Maybe it might help with understanding. That's the heavenly aspect. The earthly aspect was that this man woke up hungry. Peter. Then he went to the housetop to do something like prayer. But the waves of hunger hit him so hard and he would have aborted the entire prayer protocol if not that the, the, the food was not ready. Because the Bible says while they, while they made ready, he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he, he was doing something like prayer. There was, I want you to know that there was no serious prayer in that thing that man was doing. But the point was this. Heaven had mentioned him and even though his prayer was hypocritical it was he was just trying to use it as a pastime before the mushrooms can come out before all those other things can come out it, as as hypocritical as the prayers may be it was enough reason for heaven to disclose the the consensus recommendation and the new policy line that heaven had adopted to him A seal had been broken. And because there is a seal, if you go to the book of Revelation, you will see seals. Kingdom strategies that are captured and sealed up. And the moment they break a seal, you will see that there will be a vision. A vision so that uh, 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 men can be brought into the great and mighty things that they do not know. Because the content the information that is sealed up in the heavenlies contains things 
that are beyond our scope of knowledge that is intended to affect our civilization. A new technology from heaven is about to come into the earth. So God will need to encounter you to get you to think outside of the box, outside of what you are used to, to contemplate things that are coming down from heaven. Are you there? Okay, let me give you my own story. I don't want anybody to miss out. For many years, I operated in the office of a teacher. For many years. And I, I think I still do. All right? I, I actually thought I was called to be a teacher. You know, prophet, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. Because I was raised by a teacher. So my strongest endowment, as I speak to you now, is the endowment of a teacher. So I love teaching. And when the teacher anointing is strong on my life, it is always a blessing. So I used to do Sunday school and all of that, all kinds of teaching, training, and uh, I loved it. But a seal broke in my life. And God, what I picked when that seal broke, which was something that was too high for me to even, it would have been sacrilege for me to think about it in my heart. It had not occurred in my heart ever as, as versatile as my heart may be, it was kept from it. When the seal broke, then I realized I was called into the office of the apostle. So, I was, I was in a situation where I began to contemplate, began to think about things that were outside of the straight box of the teacher that I, I was used to. It was because I was enlarging my capacity to accommodate this new policy that came from heaven, that I was in alignment sufficient to be able to receive grace to go beyond what I was used to. And you must know how domineering the teaching anointing is. When, when, it, when it has a way of taking all of your attention, your focus. But you see, a seal had broken. If you, if you were to, if you used to know me like 18 years ago and you, you know me now, it's so different. It was because there was a policy in heaven. And this policy implicated me. And then heaven now sponsored an encounter for me to receive the full scope of the new policies in the season that I was in at the time. The moment you accept it, then that grace begins to work in your life. That was the opportunity that this man had, this man Peter had. And so he was, he was a fisherman by training and the best way to speak to him was through pictures and not words. He understood how the nets can trap a fish. And so heaven spoke to him in a language that was most suitable to his understanding. A sheet came out of the heaven. And trapped in it were all kinds of creatures. So he understood clearly that God was speaking about the Jew and the Gentile. And he said, not so long. That was the undoing of Peter. Because the book of Acts of the Apostles is a book of actors. The book was written because the apostles acted under the influence of the Holy Ghost. And there were two major actors. The entire length and breadth of that book would, would have been about Peter. But the reason that occasioned the search for Paul was that Peter, during those times of shifts into new dimensions, Peter was implicated by the decisions of heaven and he was brought into the economy of the policy. And he made a statement, not so Lord. He knew it was a Lord. He began to counsel the Lord. Now, I need to show you a few times in scripture when, when there was a proposed shift into a new dimension and the things that you are not allowed to do. It will, it will amount to sacrilege. Not so long. Then he, he, gave, he gave a record of his self-righteousness. 
that he has not eaten anything that is unclean. And he was talking to God. And he was expecting that God would be impressed. <laughs> he didn't know it was a time of a supernatural shift into a new dimension. When you see men mounting up with wings like eagles and entering into the economy of the grace of God with, with, with such brilliance, taking delivery of weights of glory, it is because of alignment. They were in alignment at a time where heaven was ready to unveil a new policy. They were implicated and they made themselves available. So the energy of God, the grace of God, that is ordained by God to facilitate that agenda of God now begins to operate in your life. And in my own opinion, we don't really work for God. He works through us. He's the one still at work, but he's working through us. He's the one that gives us the desires that we have. You would think that, oh, I desire God. Mm. The Bible says, it is God that worketh in us, both to will. That desire that you had came from his spirit. And so that's why when you walk with God, you must take inventory of desires. Because when the Holy Spirit begins to flow into your vessel as a compelling force of grace, He bequeaths to you desires. So you find Jesus many times He will ask, What seek ye? Did He not know? Okay, He went to Bartimaeus and said, What do you want me to do for you? It was obvious that the man was blind. Desire. What do you seek? You seek pounds? Sometimes we fail to understand as legitimate as it is for you to get married. That's not your purpose here. If, you, if you're going to be a true kingdom person, you will need to leave legitimate needs away by the side and prioritize yes oh when I, I, I told you my story I had money to buy a vehicle every month for seven months but God will not have me have a vehicle in Lagos and what he was teaching me was that see it is not what you perceive your need to be that is your need. So I saw that it was very possible for me to live without a car for seven years. My sense of need changed and I realized what I needed was God. Him that had the ability to swallow up my infirmity. So if I don't have a car, it doesn't make any difference. But I can't stay without God. Because He is my sufficient. As long as I don't have access to His power in my vessel, all the symptoms of my insufficiency will begin to find expression. And Satan will, be, will take advantage. Satan knows the psychology of men. He knows the weaknesses of men. He knows how men operate. He's been around a very long time he knew what your grandfather's weakness was what your great grandfather's weakness was he knew the kind of weakness he sowed into your bloodline and he knows how to show up when to show up he knows what to create in the environment that will reveal that weakness and you will exploit if you know how infamed you are you will realize how much you need God sometimes God if you allow him to exercise his government over your life he will use that authority to put you in a position where you realize how much you need him for many of us here what you think you need is a husband and that's legitimate but that's on one level but if you can if you can achieve kingdom alignment and you prioritize your life and seek first that which is obtainable in the kingdom, you'll find out the things 
those other desires you have they will line up that's how the kingdom man's life is as he apprehends kingdom things the things that he needs are supportive supportive infrastructure that will make him capable of fulfilling the will of God they will navigate in his direction so he doesn't need to seek for things the things will migrate into his life I never ask God pastor I never ask God for a wife never you know they say pray about your life partner I don't know how they pray that prayer I don't know how they pray for I was just doing my thing just doing my thing doing I was lost in God and God now point I say hey This was added. And there's a difference when God adds something and when you add something. Let me give you an, an account of my life. Not every woman can marry me. In fact, the percentage is so... Is... Okay. For 11 years, because of the, my job in the oil sector in Nigeria, I was not at home. For 11 years. How many women will stay? It's not about the, 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 the public appearance of saying, I, I'm married. No. God gave her to me and she understood the risk. Because I was already lost in God. When God pointed her. And I asked for, you know, my wife is dark in complexion. I said, because my mother is fair, I say, is there no white, uh, fair version of... And the Lord told me something. He said, there is no fair version of what you need on my shelf. It took me 10 years to know why he said. Once upon a time, oh, those days when the anointing broke on my life. Those early days. I actually saw a lady that was the image of what I had in mind. Yes, I saw. She was exactly, if I were to make a pick, that, that is. I live long enough to also see the outcome of her life. Because when I wanted to propose, the great one didn't accept it. I lost my peace. He took away my center of gravity. So I couldn't have found I have lived long enough to see what I would have chosen for myself. If this lady gets angry for, for three days, she does not eat. Nobody on earth can appease her. That was what I, I, that was, what I was going to choose. <laughs> May the Lord give you understanding. <laughs> that was, with all my intelligence, that was where I was going. Seek him first, he says, the kingdom. There must be a, a sense of priority that is found in your life. And then you give God the opportunity to command the things that you need to fulfill your divine destiny to navigate in your own direction. Oh, if you begin to seek mom, money, mammon will possess your soul. And then you will see life from the perspective of the doctrine of mammon. Mammon will educate you and give you a new lens from whence you see things. So when God's purpose is upon the face of the earth, are about to go to the next level, what he does is that he breaks a seal. Whenever a seal is broken in heaven, it means God wants to usher people that are in alignment into a new dimension. He has his own ways of getting his policies into your head. He can give you a vision. And he keeps giving you until you accept it. He can give you an encounter. But heaven will speak to you. And give you a very little understanding of what is about to come in the days ahead. So that you can prepare yourself. That's what happened to Peter. Let me show you another. So the lesson we learned from Peter is in these days you don't tell the Lord not so long. There, there is one person at least, I can see one person in the room 
and you used to have some strange encounters. A time came that you could no longer manage it and he was looking crazy and you told God, not so long. And from that time to today, you have experienced a very terrible spiritual drought. Not so long. We are going to repent. If by any means at any point in time in our lives, by word or deed, we said what Peter said, not so long. Because that's the greatest entrance into a shift, a shift into another dimension. So that's the first scenario. Second scenario, before I bring some, some issues, some issues on how the inner workings, inner orientation of the heart in dealing with the articles of a new dimension, how to manage it within your heart. John, John chapter 15, verse 14, John 14, Jesus speaks about a new regime. In John chapter number 14, beginning from verse number 15, Jesus says, he gave a very long presentation and the reason for the elaborate presentation was that he wanted to acquaint his disciples with a new season, a new regime of the economy of God, a new regime of the administration of God. So that's what it is about. In verse 15, Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. That ye may ab that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, that is in the present, and shall be in you. We are going to look at that. He dwelleth with you. The spirit of truth dwells with them and he was referring to himself. But he was talking about a regime, a time, a new dimension. When he that dwelt with them will now dwell in them by the spirit. Are you with me? It's, it's a new dimension. And you know, how many of you, oh no, you don't, you don't know. But I, I want to tell you that the tools, the utensils you use during cultivation, just in case you are involved in agriculture is different from the implements that you use during harvest. It's a new dimension. Harvest doesn't look like cultivation. And that's, that's how it is in the realm of the spirit. You, know, you need to know when the shift has taken place because it will require a new implement. So Jesus is saying that I am with you now but I will be with you in the days to come. Exactly. Okay, let me tell you what it means. He said, I am physically present. I'm a present Jesus now. But the time is going to come when I'm going to be invincible. My reality will be trapped in the Holy Ghost. So, I want to, you to see the lecture Jesus gave them. A lecture that was supposed to be a support lecture to make them acquainted with this new regime in the economy of God that was about to be administered. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. So Jesus gave them some, new, some, some insights. The first thing Jesus said was about love. The if you, and it, it's an if, because he said, I'm not sure. The issue of Love for God cannot be overemphasized when you are relating with the invincible Jesus. Your link, the basis of his government and his regulation of your life is connected to your love, your passion. for. So he is revealing here that the proof that you love him is obedience, not tears like many of us do during worship. Meanwhile, 
We like seeing people cry anyway. Under the influence of heavy worship, and you cry. Oh, but that tear, the tears you shed, is not a mark of love. It, it will be in your interest to know that. Jesus said, Hallelujah. Jesus said, I'm going to leave you guys. You will not see me physically. They knew everything has changed. And in those days where I will be trapped in the spirit and I will not be physically present with you, the issue of love is critical. And the proof that you love me is that you obey me. The devil is going to try as much as possible for you to have something else you obey. Man was created as a creature of obedience. That's how we are wired. You obey something. You must obey something. Yeah, you know, the other day I was just walking. I decided to take a stroll from the hotel that I was in. And I saw some guys, they were just around very small, small tables. They had big, big, big vase of beer. And they were, I, I was watching one in, in, he was just doing his, 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 his <laughs> <laughs> he was in the mood. Unknown to him, he was obeying something. That's how we are wired. You must serve something. And according to the scriptures, there are, there are five possible things that you are likely to serve. According to the scriptures, they, the scriptures uh, summarize it. It's either you serve the world, you serve sin, you serve Satan, you serve self, you serve mammon. Those, those are the five possible things. And they are there. They are weaved into your ecosystem. And that's the reason for sanctification. I need to explain some terminologies. Sanctification. What does it mean? It means that I'm separated unto God, so I give him the opportunity to saturate me. See, if you're not saturated, lust can drive you. If you're not saturated, want, covetousness can drive you. If you're not saturated, Satan's temptation can become a logical approach to life. So you will need to be saturated so that you are alive unto God. But that saturation does not take place until you separate yourself. Separation of self is that you accept that only God should operate my vessel. Seeing is there, hoping to, to get the handle of your life and so that your life will be interpreted according to his government. We were designed to serve something. And, and you know, the, in, in this part of the world, Western world, because the average person is intelligent, goes to school, does first degree, second degree, master's degree, and maybe two master's degree, one PhD, he, he believes he's enlightened. And many of us do not know that the things we studied actually made us slaves. Made us see through just one perspective that hedged us in. If God wants to liberate you, he gives you spiritual knowledge through the Holy Ghost. But there's not much God can do in your life if you are not part of those that have decided to be separated unto him. We have, hallelujah. Oh, you're not with me. Separated. Yes. You see, when you become separated unto him, you become a candidate for a saturation. And when you are saturated by him, you'll be living life from his perspective. So you are going to be a creature that is very different from normal mortal. And mortals are going to give you names. You know, you are... You are strange, you are a Jew, you are that. That's a proof that you are not in the ecosystem. You are off. You are in this world, but you are not of it. It is clear that your preferences point to the fact that something else has caught up, has taken your passion. 
So if we are talking, are you, are you there? You know that scripture I read? I don't know if I read it in the last conference we had. The scripture about, um, about Saul when he was going to visit Samuel. And Samuel told him that the spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You'll be changed into another man. Your temperament. So there are levels of saturation of God that can come on your life. Your current temperament, your current wiring will change. Your current disposition will change. That comes as a result of saturation. You know, the first we spoke about sanctification um, briefly during the last day of the supernatural shift. I'm separated unto him. I, I don't want to serve the world. The world has the things it throws at you. It's trying to capture your attention and give you an, a, a world view to life. But when you are saturated with him, you see from a different vista. That which is attracting people, you are even wondering how it attracted them. Are you with me? There was a time in scripture in the book of Songs of Solomon, you will hear wisdom crying in the street. You know why wisdom was crying? Wisdom was crying because he is the principle, he is a reality by which our lives should be governed. So wisdom is surprised that we are going about our daily life without him. So it's what we do. Why are you coping? <coughs> he stands at the corner of the streets. Only men that are saturated, men that separate themselves to him, that you see, the only reason why I live, huh? because of it. Meanwhile, the theological basis of the authority of God over our lives is in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. The Bible says, In that he died for all, that they which live should no longer live unto themselves, but unto him that died and rose again. That means, are you here? Oh, you are not here. Now, let me explain that scripture to you. Are you with me? The principle, you know, God is a God of ways. He has a lot of wisdom. But the principle he decided to adopt in achieving our salvation was substitution. All right, so Jesus took your place in death. That's not the whole truth. He took your place so that you will take his own place. That's the, that's the full formula of substitution. So if you are a recipient of the salvation which cost Jesus his death. It is therefore illegal for you to want to live life the way you want. You lost, you lost that opportunity by your salvation. The only door left for you to tread upon is the door of what Jesus would have done if it were you. That's the only meaning of your own life now. And if Jesus were me, he would be a teacher. Like, like I'm doing now. Because it, it is not, it's not what I intended to be. I was being programmed to be a lecturer. Yes. I could, oh my God, those days. I don't know if I'm still intelligent, but I used to be intelligent. I don't know anymore. Those days I can cram this book, this one. I will cram it. I will lift it in my brain. If you have an exam, I will drop it for you. That was how I, the only reason why I didn't read medicine was because I couldn't see blood. I would just I would become the prayer point. <laughs> so I and I had this ability to teach. It was inherent. So I believed that I was to be a lecturer. I would have been a professor by now. That was what I wanted. Then the Lord now said, "There is all the script written about you. There is no one that says you'll be a lecturer." You're called to be a preacher of my word. So I spent years of study in this book because that's, that's what Jesus would have done in my vessel if he were physically present. I've lost the right to choose to be a lecturer. I lost it long ago. Are you with me? If you are not separated unto him, it will not be possible for him to endure you with that level of anointing that will make you operate in another dimension. Because the Bible says that when the Spirit comes upon Saul, he will be changed into another man. 
That's another man that he cannot be on this measure. He's going to be another man when that dimension of grace comes upon him. He will pull him into another state of existence. His basis of evaluation will be different. His scale of measurement will be different. His outlook will be different. Because there is an investment upon him that brings him into another possible level of application of himself, which is that level which is captured concerning him in the creed of the Lord. So what makes us who we are are the dimensions of saturation that we carry. You want to operate in a new dimension? It, it comes by saturation. And that saturation cannot take place except you become separate unto him. He says, sanctify yourself. He says, separate yourself. Purge yourself. Today and tomorrow. I'm going to do wonders. Something beyond the norm. Something that you are used to. It, we have decided in heaven that this is the way of things now. But you need to do something upon the face of the earth in order for you to come into alignment with the policies of heaven. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my command. Become an agency through which my will can prosper in the earth. Become an infrastructure through which my dominion can be registered upon the face of the earth. Let your, the meaning of your life be that you are living to serve my way. If you have that orientation, he said, then I will pray the Father so that he can orchestrate a saturation. He can send the full compendium of what you will require to prosecute my mission is in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the moment he becomes the one that administers your affairs, your outlook, the things you pray about today, some of them are obedience issues, not demonic issues. They are not necessarily demonic issues. They are obedience issues. They will, they will, they will naturally fizzle out if you are in obedience with God. So the first thing we need to do in our prayer is that God will help us to repent from every time we say not so Lord. Second thing we need to do is to understand that in this new dimension the proof of love is obedience. Just like the proof of trust is dependence. The proof of love is obedience. And in order for you to be a recipient of spiritual capital, love is the requirement. If you love me, keep my commandment. And so the release of the Holy Ghost was predicated on obedience. Oh, you are not with me. All right. I think we need to pick a simple scripture to confirm that. And that will be Acts chapter 5 verse 32. Jesus is linking the presence of the Holy Spirit, the measure of the Holy Spirit you carry to obedience in this scripture. And Acts chapter 5, verse number 32 says something. What does it say? It says, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God had given to them that obey him. It means there's a dimension of the Holy Ghost that is only available to obedient people. That was what Jesus was saying to the disciples. Now that I'm going to be in the spirit, <laughs> obedience is not an option anymore. When you begin to obey, I will be praying the Father so that greater measures of his spirit can be tabernacled in your life which makes you possible to operate in new dimension. Do you get that? Alright, so. Okay, we'll go back. So there's an obedience requirement here 
which is a proof of the fact that you have been separated to God and you know that the reason for your existence now is to serve his will not to serve yourself but to serve his will if I'm living to serve his will he's going to come into my space and say okay this is how much you earn this is how much you will give me oh if God has never exercised his government in your financial life it means you didn't give him the authority to speak so your submission did not come to a point where he felt the liberty to begin to exercise government over your life. I and my wife can have a misunderstanding and I walk away. In my own opinion, I have all the facts that she's wrong. Then he shows up. He shows up and says, If you continue this thing, your wilderness journey will be extended. Say, Are you not seeing this? Then he won't talk again. So, because of what I have with him, I love him. I don't want to lose him. I will go and do what? And obey. Even though in obeying, I die. <laughs> Are you seeing what I'm talking about? The love for God that you have becomes the basis by which he constrains you not to walk in the flesh. If God cannot constrain you, it means there is no connection of love between both of you. Because the instrument he's going to use to exercise his government on you is a love that only you and him know about. So when you hear people like Peter say, Silver and gold I do not have, but such as I have. What's the meaning of that? He was saying, I have something in common with Jesus. And that thing I have can sponsor this miracle. So the question is, what do you have with Jesus? What do you have with Jesus? One of my pastors, his mom came to me and said he saw his son dead. I said, no, people don't die around me. The pastor, I saw him. It's okay. I believe you. I called him from the field. I said, you stay with me now for the next few months. Your mom said you die. Now, this guy was trying to hide a brain tumor from me. He had a brain tumor. So when he stayed with me, I said, don't preach. Don't just stay with me. Eat with me. Let's just be walking around. If I go out, you come with me. If I come back, we finished praying in the night and he was to go sleep. He slumped. I said, Pastor, what is this? He has this pain. See? You didn't tell me. So we took him for CT scan. And after the scan, the doctor said there was a tumor in his brain. And you know what? The doctor is my friend. So they, I don't know whether he told the doctor to hide it. So for one month, I was not aware. Until the slum again. Say, hey, doctor, what was the result of that scan? They say, ah, they say tumor. Tumor? Ah, I called another doctor in a, in a kitty state. Because I know that the neurosurgeons in Nigeria are few. Good ones are few. So I said, okay, there's one, there are two in Kaduna, there are two in Abuja that are reliable. So we now contacted the one in Kaduna. So it was as if the, the dream, are, are you with me? of his mom that he brought to me was as if it was going to come to pass. So we now say, okay, um, my friend is not a neurosurgeon, but he has a hospital. I said, we know this. I dedicated that hospital. So we know this place. So the surgery must take place in your hospital. So let the other doctor that is a neurosurgeon bring his equipment to your theater. We'll be more comfortable with that. He said, okay, no problem. So they brought all the equipment to the theater. They tested all the medical physics equipment they were they were in top shape and then the operation began my pastor died he died on the table so i went back to god i said god i don't have the vocabulary to go back to this guy's mom to tell him that his son died 
if you still if you still have me in mind bring him back to life he was dead for 38 minutes on the table 38 minutes later he came back to life now oh, you, you are you are clapping for the wrong things you i know you are seeing that okay he's a big man of god you are wrong i have something with jesus i have something with jesus that's what i'm saying because of what i have if he says, wake up, go and apologize to your wife, and there's no problem, I will just wake up. <laughs> I can even sing for her. <laughs> she might think I'm a romantic man. She doesn't know I want to keep what I have with Jesus. I want to keep what I have. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to keep what I have. If you have something you will know nobody will teach you to obey him that's the only way you will keep it i'll go preaching big conferences and everybody's hailing me but there was something i said jesus was angry when i finish i go back and lie down sometimes he will tell you don't preach again for the next two weeks you talk to me go and sit down so for two weeks i'll be Telling him I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For two weeks. Oh, you know why? You might say, Oh, I have something. The way we behave, we that have something. The way we behave is different from normal people. Normal people can come and lie and say, and they'll be excited. We, you say something that he did not approve for you to say. It's not as if the thing is a lie. He, he, he's already expressing his displeasure. And there's no way you, he can be well with you if he's not pleased. Two weeks, sit down, sit down, sit down and learn and read the book of Psalms and be wise. So you'll be reading. Then you, you will come when you are frustrated and say, stand up. Don't do that thing. So even when you are talking on the pulpit, you know he's behind you. And in the day when demons team up to kill you, to destroy you, we see a power, a power that Satan knows nothing of, rise to defend you. There are dimensions in God that are occasioned by saturation. And if you want to keep the saturation that brings those dimensions into your heart, you will need to prioritize obedience. So I, I think I've said that. Are you still with me? All right. So. I will do something quickly. I'll do something quick. I'll just mention some things and then we'll pray. The presence of God here will pierce people's heart. The one that will happen this night because pastor says there are some spiritual things that will be receiving. Things will come upon your heart. new season will begin for you in the name of Jesus Christ now this is what Jesus said I don't have time to read that scripture it's John chapter 20 from verse 22 Jesus made a statement he says as the father has sent me so send I you when he made that statement he did something are you with me that's that's a new dimension that he's calling them into. He said, it's the dimension of the measure of the kind of ministry I had when the Father sent me. That's the dimension that you are going to have now. He did something that showed us how the Father sent him. He breathed on them. Hmm? It means that in heaven, when Jesus was to be sent from heaven, the Father breathed on him. And the Father entered into Jesus by the Spirit. Is that clear? So what Jesus did here was that he lived the Father. Every pressure, the personality that was trapped in his heart. Are you with me? That the Spirit of God was projecting in the heart of Jesus was Jesus' Father. So he lived him. It was his will he did. You will hear Jesus said, there are the words I speak, they are not mine. 
So he spoke the father's words. He lived the father's life. He was a mere theater that gave his father expression. Because the father blew his, himself into Jesus as the spirit. So Jesus was commissioning them into the same experience. See, as the father has sent me, so send I you. Then he to receive the spirit. So Jesus as the spirit was the one who was living inside them. Exactly. So the desires that came from the spirit were actually Jesus' desires that were superimposed on their heart. So if we want to see the way Jesus lived his father, because Jesus is the best example of how spiritual invincible capital is deposited on the life of an individual and the person lives from that standpoint, from that dimension. Oh, did you get that? So I will just mention two things. There are seven things, but I'll mention two things and then we'll pray. John chapter 6 John chapter 6 verse 57 He said as the living father had sent me and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me shall live by me. This is deep. As the living Father has sent me. And I live by the Father. I live. What does Jesus mean when he says, I live by the Father? Because he has defined what life meant for him. Life for Jesus was leaving the father. It means he can't do anything. It's what he perceives that his father is doing. That is life for him. In the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, which is the summary of the New Testament. It's, if you want to summarize the New Testament in one verse, it's Galatians 2. It is no longer I. So the I element, the, 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 the knowledge, the consciousness that derives from your soul, which is self-centered, self-seeking by the fall, you, you, you paralyze it, you put it aside. And then you adopt the personality that lives in your spirit by the New Testament arrangement as your real personality. It's no longer I. The soul man is kept aside. Your real, your real personality now in the new covenant is the person of Christ that is in your spirit. Are you seeing the challenge? The guy that is in your soul, which is a fallen man, will be trying to express itself. But Paul is saying, I found life. I found the definition of life. And the definition of life is that it's no longer I that is living through my vessel. It is Christ. For are you here? The the what Paul is saying here is not a changed life because many of you, your perspective of a super Christian is the one whose life has changed. What is going on here is not change, it's not gradual development, it's not approximation. What is going on here is exchange, it's no longer me. It is Christ. That's the, that's the story of the gospel. It's exchange, not change. It's exchange. Oh, somebody, somebody might feel because I found some widows and I made commitments that I'm going to see their children through school and they knelt down and they began to thank me. I said, see, you are wrong. I'm not the one that is good. You are, you are seeing it. No. It is the one that is in me that is doing this. This is not me. 
So you are thanking the wrong person. The falling man will not give. The falling man will not find compassion. But there is someone else in my vessel. It is if you need someone desperately to thank, all things must be to him. For it is no longer I that lives. It is not me that is at work. It is him that dwells in me. I found that the meaning of life is to adopt him as my true personality. I deny that falling personality expression from my vessel and I adopt the personality that resides in my spirit as my true personality. That's the story of the Christian life. It's exchange, not change. Okay? That's number one. I'm telling you about that life. When Jesus said, I said, Father, send me. So I live by him. So this definition of life was living the Father. And that was the summary of Paul's explanation. It's no longer I. It's no longer I. I was the one that wanted to be a lecturer. And the reason why I wanted to be a lecturer was because I could cram. So I wanted to come to the class without notes and just give them notes, give them notes, give, draw diagrams, draw. That's the fallen man. That's how he thinks. He thinks of vainglory. Thinks of me. I must be on the stage. Everyone must know that I am sound. That's how the fallen man thinks. But the man in Christ doesn't mind to be hidden. If only God will see him and be pleased, it's okay. Yes. It's no longer I. The regime of a fallen self, it ended so that I can leave Christ. He now revealed to us what living meant for him. He said, for me to leave is Christ. He's giving expression to the person that is trapped on my heart. It is my obligation to reveal him through my thoughts, through my heart. That's life. That's the kind of life when you leave, he begins to give ventilation to you. He's excited. You feel peace. Yeah. Yeah. So for a kingdom man, when you lose your peace, it's a serious matter. It means that there are issues of misrepresentation or God is, is using that as a means to stop you from entering into something that is not his way. Loss of peace is critical. Because part of the rewards we receive in this age, before the age that is to come, is that it brings us into peace, into joy. Have you ever seen that scripture when he said, enter into the joy of your Lord? Righteousness, peace, that's the proof. When you begin to feel peace, you are striking the mark in the kingdom where it matters. When the Lord in you, your heart is joyful. Have you read your Bible? That is actually the reason for your strength. It's a means for God to empower you to advance on that path that you are going. And when there's joy in your vessel, you can survive great contradictions. You can survive financial hardships and still be positive under pressure. Because the Lord in you is excited. This is the journey that the Lord calls his people to walk in these days where you refuse to give the fallen man expression and Christ in you becomes your life. Living Christ becomes your life. That's number one. Should we stop there? Away? Okay, we'll add number two. Number two is in John chapter 14. I'll stop on that note, then we pray. John chapter 14. Verse 10. He said, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? 
He's talking about um, the reality. It means they cohere in each other. He's dwelling in his father. And his father is dwelling in him. And it is because his father is dwelling in him that he can speak the father's words. Because he hears it in him. That's the same arrangement we have in the New Testament. First John chapter 4 verse 13. The Bible says by this we know that we... Huh? First John 4 13. Where are you? Oh, the technical man. First John 4 13. Ah. Do we have it? He said, Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us, just like Jesus dwells in the Father, and the Father dwells in him. You are not with me. The proof that you co inherit in Christ. That means you dwell in Christ and Christ dwells in you. Is that He has given you all His Spirit. Do you have His Spirit? It means that your, your life is mystical. There is no physical connection between you and Christ, but this is the spiritual connection. The Holy Ghost. It means this is the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord. Your connection with Christ, just like a baby's connection with her mom. Is the umbilical cord. If the mom drinks coke, eats mushroom, the child has eaten mushroom, the child has drank coke. I found that meal here, mushroom. <laughs> so your umbilical cord spiritually is, is the Holy Ghost. Through him, that which is of Christ comes into your vessel. That which is in you, your spirit can exercise itself in prayer. He comes to him. Making him the mediator of this new covenant. Everything that comes from you, maybe you pray. Huh? The prayer doesn't get to the Father directly. It is processed through his office. So it is office that, that converts your prayer into a form that heaven can understand are you with me have you ever prayed before and you felt your prayers were answered has it happened to you before how did you know is what the father transmitted back came to his office his office now converted it to a form that can be mild that you can receive in knowing upon your heart if the father were to transmit directly into you have you ever seen thunder lightning that's how it would have been Oh, and I'm not laughing. Because on the mount, on the mount when Moses was coming down, that was how the father was transmitting. You don't have the resources, you don't have the infrastructure to receive and to understand the intelligence and to contain the power of that thunderbolt at that level. An office manages it and allows it to drop upon your heart like, like tender fires of grace. This man, Jesus Christ, he is our essence. Part of our calling is to leave him out. And the way he sits in pastor is different from the way he sits in me. Even though there are similarities. And that's why there are dimensions that will operate through him that will only operate through him for all eternity. Because God is so vast that he can have varieties. But Satan is very limited. And that's why he groups his slaves in categories. He can manage each and every member of his workforce as an individual. He must manage them as a group. He doesn't have the infrastructure to do that. The administration doesn't have it. So he needs to, needs to get people to be acquainted with the same kind of loss. The same kind of sin. And from the days of our ancestors till now, it has not improved. It's the same sin. But God can manage you as an individual that is different from any other individual. And there's enough administration to manage you at that level. But you will never know until you know the umbilical cord. So you will never touch Jesus except you know the Holy Spirit. The reason why we can't avoid knowing the Holy Spirit, that is the only way we can link to our source. Our source resides in him. 
your life is what Christ brings through the Holy Ghost to you. That's your life. And you don't want to leave anything else. I will serve Jesus. I will walk with Jesus. I will obey Jesus. That is your life. I will serve Jesus. I will walk with Jesus. I will obey Jesus. You can be upstanding. Now, we'll stop here today. We'll stop here for today. We'll stop here for today. A new set of functionaries arise in the body of Christ. People that have had unique dealings with God and they are unique expressions of God upon their lives that are designed to shape the body of Christ and make the body competent for the season of the end times. Men that God will give vocabulary to talk about holy things, holy things that were never contemplated in ages past. Because God wants to manifest himself in the brightest colors through his people in this generation. Something has shifted in the realm of the spirit. And that's what, what we are receiving words from God to describe. May somebody in this place say, Lord, I will never say not so to you again. Make that your prayer. I will never say not so. Because I know that the policies that are coming from heaven have my name attached to them. There is something about me that heaven is interested in. That's why I'm still alive right now. I will never say not so to you because you want to build from my life that which can convey your essence can manifest your glory in the best colors that's why you apprehended me in Jesus Christ I will never say not so I will never say not so. I will never say not so. I take a coma, my baby. Samina like over Oh, that's why he encountered you the other night, showed you visions of glory. This is because he wants to take you on a journey. There's something. You have been designed to do and he came to show you a glimpse so that you can think outside of the box tonight something will rest on your life come on see me like roske valamante kusabala mamoriaka like kose na niko presko velamo sati niko presko velahabra Kava sata babonde kete kele boboria sume na mana 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 mai. In the name of Jesus, I see like five people in the congregation, and God is calling you to a place of intimacy. He's calling you into a place. There's a place in Himself. He's inviting you into. An anointing from heaven is going to transport you into that place. An anointing from heaven will transport you into that place. He's waiting for you in a place. And there's an anointing that will transport you there. It's already coming. It's coming so strong. There are five people. You'll be transported. He's taking you to a place. A place in the spirit. Transportation is taking place. He's moving you. He's moving you. His hand is becoming stronger. Holy Spirit. It's a call to intimacy. It's a call to intimacy. The Lord calls you. There is a place in His presence that He wants you to enter. And tonight, there is entry.
I see a linen vessel, a linen garment, a linen garment descending from heaven. There is a linen garment and the Holy Spirit says to me that this garment is the garment of his presence. There is somebody here, the Lord will reveal his presence to you in the next seven seconds. It will come so tangibly. It will be so tangible. It will be so tangible. You can feel it around you. It will be so tangible. It's a calling. It's a calling to become a messenger of his presence. It's a calling. It's a calling. His hand is resting. He's introducing his presence to you. Step into that place because his glory covers you you will no longer be ordinary you will no longer be the same his glory covers you yes there is something he wants to do with your life your life will resonate around glory and so he's introducing you to a taste of what his presence looks like and so there's a tangible dimension of his glory that rests upon you. He's introducing you so that you can be bold to come unto the throne of grace. So that you can be bold to approach unto him. He's determined to show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Jesus! Someone in the congregation see the anointing of a prophetic intercessor on your life the Lord will increase your measure tonight and you will feel the heat of the grace of God you will feel the heat of the grace of God your rank is changing your rank is changing your rank is changing there is a shift already in the name of Jesus So quickly, if you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, it's time for us to gain ascendancy. It's time to speak in tongues. We are moving. We are mounting up. 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 Things are beginning to open. Things are opening. Things are opening. Things are opening. Ah! Suvaya to me! Sahilema Kofi la mosik abide Receive what God is offering you In the name of Jesus Receive what God is offering you In the name of Jesus Receive what God is offering you in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and begin to just stir up your spirit. God is depositing things. God is giving people new prayer mantles. God is giving people the spirit of grace and supplication to press their closet into that new dimension. The Bible says, 
until the Spirit of God was born upon us from on high. The wilderness then became a fruitful field, and then the fruitful field became as unto a forest. The Spirit of God is turning wilderness lives 